Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we'll be talking about the Zen 5 and Zen 6 leaks that came out in the past week from an AMD engineer. Additionally, we'll be talking about Intel's L4 cache. This is a big change to Intel CPU architecture, and they haven't done something quite in this style since maybe Broadwell. And then finally, EVGA losing a major product manager, uh, and we'll talk about that here too. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Lian Li Lancool 216. The Lancool 216 is a high-quality, mid-range case with uniquely shaped and molded front intake fans that maintain an effective, high-flow cooling solution while keeping the case in the mid-tower form factor. The case also has a movable motherboard tray to maximize installation and build options, and it has heavy ventilation that allows good cooling performance evenly throughout the case. Learn more at the link in the description below. This is a pretty short one. One of AMD's engineers updated their LinkedIn profile. This is like the newest way for leaks to happen. It starts to feel a little corporate, like how do we let people know in a legitimate way that there's a new product? What if we just have someone update their LinkedIn profile to oops, accidentally listed something unannounced? Uh, cynicism aside, one of AMD's engineers updated the uh, the LinkedIn profile to list Zen 5 and the technically unannounced Zen 6, which uh, specifically this is Zen 6 targeting the server market. And that's the main thing we know right now. The new information is limited. According to the leak, Zen 5 will be codenamed Nirvana and it will be on the three nanometer process node. Now we did some digging here at Gamers Nexus. We learned a couple of other things that no one else is reporting on. First of all, that Zen 5 codename Nirvana part, it will ship in a heart-shaped box that smells like AMD fanboys. It was a Nirvana, you know what, never mind. And uh, AMD has a couple of other pieces too. So Zen 6, that one is actually shipping alongside the Puddle of Zen refresh. And adjacent to that product stack, there will be the new Sound Ryzen processor. It's like. It's like a back to the 90s. Let's not forget Zen and Chains either. Okay, I'll stop. So Zen 6 is allegedly named Morpheus. None of those other things I said were real, except for the Nirvana thing. And Zen 6 will be on a two nanometer node. We don't know anything about Zen 6 yet, but according to AMD's public Zen roadmap, Zen 5 will be based on both four nanometer and three nanometer silicon. It could be that the engineer was referring specifically to Zen 5C, which is planned to come after the normal Zen 5 launch. It's no surprise that AMD is designing and developing these chips. It's not like AMD is going to stop, but companies usually want to keep the release of new information limited to intentional events. Every once in a while, somebody slips. Let's just hope they don't use the code name Lake of Fire for, I guess they kind of did that when they did the whole Volcanic Islands GPUs. Actual code name, by the way, if you weren't around for that specific launch. Not the best naming. Up next, so a story about EVGA. Jacob Freeman, who's been a longtime product manager and man of many hats at EVGA, has decided to depart the company. He tweeted this on Twitter. That's where you tweet things. Uh, in the past week, he's going to be staying in the industry, but there's no publicly known uh, destination at this time where he's going. But I wanted to give some background on what Jacob has done in the industry because He's one of the people who you don't hear too much about directly, but he was very involved in all the product launches they did. He uh, worked as the primary media contact, but he also basically worked as a PM or a product manager. So EVJ is a very interestingly structured company. It's the reason they never quite scaled to a point where they could just hand off to another CPU, C CPU to another CEO. Sorry, Andrew Han. Uh, but at the same time, that unique structure is what allowed them to produce the types of products they did and have that sort of more um, product-focused and community-focused approach. So the way they're structured, there's really only a couple people who kind of make all the decisions at the top of the company. They, re they report directly to the CEO. And they have a lot of freedom to make decisions within their respective groups. So Jacob is one of those where even though he's a PM, and also the media relations contact, and also the community manager, uh, and also the guy who resolves a lot of the problems internally for figuring out warranty issues or whenever there's some kind of big like controversy or event like the POS caps thing or the thermal pads for ACX, a lot of the decision making would fall on Jacob. Whether or not it was originally his problem, it now becomes his problem in the way it was set up. And like I said, he handled the media events. He was at every single trade show 
uh, the guy probably traveled, uh, I don't even know, like multiple times a month, pre-pandemic at least, for industry events. So he is easily one of the hardest working people in the industry I know, and I wanted to specifically make note of his contributions here because I don't think a lot of people really know the names behind the products besides you kind of know Vince or Kingpin, um, and you know people like High Cookie from Gigabyte maybe, but beyond that, not too many people are familiar with the individuals in the industry. So I have worked with Jacob directly since about 2011 or 2012, uh, and the entire time he was at EBGA, he was one of the earliest manufacturers after Kingston and HyperX, shout out to Dave, to actually take us seriously and work with us to allow us the privilege of reviewing products back before I had any capability whatsoever to buy them to review myself. That was, that was before we really had any income. I mean, we were losing money because it was, it was just me basically. Uh, so the early companies that said, you know what, let's trust this guy with no views, uh, not much of a following, and uh, honestly, not much experience yet, and, uh, and just hope that he produces a solid review. And that's how I learned. That's how I got to where I am now. So, you know, Jacob, I think, will be a, a huge asset to any company he lands at. We don't know where yet, but we know he's staying in the industry, and that's good news. Uh, and the same goes for people like Vince or Kingpin. You know, he's still at EVGA right now. We don't know what his plans are at the moment publicly. And uh, Joe Darwin, also at EVJ, he's, I think, basically the COO, if not literally the COO. And uh, Joe Darwin is the one who handles all the business side stuff. He's still there. And uh, similar contributions to Jacob, where he's been there forever and seems like really the kind of ride or die type with the CEO. So anyway, that's the structure right now. Uh, there was some other news on this topic this week where the longtime PR director, Brian Del Rizzo, is retiring from NVIDIA. So he's, as we understand it, not moving to another company. He's just straight up retiring, which is awesome. Congratulations to Brian or BDR. But same thing where another major industry contributor and not someone you hear about a lot, but he is the one who would have to sort of deal with and process all of our very many complaints and problems with NVIDIA products over the years. And I think sometimes people cynically look at someone in a PR role and they go, oh, your job is damage control. But what's really not understood here and the reason why we shout out the people who do really important contributions is people who actually do care about the outcome. And BDR, Jacob, a couple others in the industry, AMD has uh, Matt Hurwitz. Uh, all of these people are actually critical to enabling the press to continue to comment in a way that is open and critical because they as much as they help the company deal with the aftermath or the damage, they also try to keep the bridge open when executives are going, why are we still working with Gamers Nexus? They're loose cannons, they're causing us problems. It's normally the PR or the technical um, media contact who go, oh, hold on, like they have a point, they're kind of right, can we do something about it? Like and not just blacklist them? So BDR worked at NVIDIA for about 22 years. He started in media, he was, uh, I worked, I think, alongside Gordon, Gordon Ma'an from PC World now, and did that for several years and then moved to NVIDIA. Um, I won't get too much into his plans, but he's basically just retiring and then planning to hopefully do something with other passions in the future, like a potential animal shelter. So uh, anyway, that's the news on major sort of players within the industry moving around this week. We put them both in here. Really convenient or curious timing that Jacob departs EVGA as Jacob, who handled media relations, as BDR is departing NVIDIA for retirement. We'll see if, if the, uh, the obvious assumption here becomes true or not, but for now, we don't officially know. So we don't talk about the people within the industry too much. We kind of did that with that EVGA story when we did the final tour of their facilities. Uh, and that opened our eyes internally in terms of the types of content we can create. It's like, you know, the individuals aren't really that known and we'd kind of like them to be because as they, people move company to company, uh, they're taking that skill set with them and bringing their contributions elsewhere. And it's important to document not just what the companies do, but the people who are making the things that the companies actually benefit from in terms of publicity. And in this situation, especially, you know, we're in a position we can shine some light 
on some of the contributions people have made that the public might not be aware of. And um, you know, at different times throughout the career, I've butted heads with everybody when we've encountered problems with the product or whatever. And it always comes down to how did they handle that? And the people who were able to take a step back and get out of corporate defense mode and into trying to understand our viewpoint on behalf of the consumers, those are the people who make the important contributions uh, and, and especially are the ones we want to bring a light to because they deserve some, some specific respect and name recognition. So anyway, uh, we'll keep updating you on stuff like that. First big hardware story for the week beyond those is the RTX 4070 designs. So this is, uh, this is Brian Del Rizzo right now immediately stops watching the video. He's like, this isn't my problem anymore. I can finally get away from Steve and his criticism. Uh, so the RTX 4070 just launched as the mid-range option. And by mid-range, we mean not that. It's, it's what used to be the high end. It is literally more expensive than the former flagships that NVIDIA sold, inflation aside. But they're calling it mid-range. So uh, this is a $600 card. We have a full review on the channel. We have a teardown. It's actually got a pretty small PCB for the Founders Edition model, which you can see our separate teardown for that if you're interested. But small PCB aside, nothing fixes the fact that it's 600 bucks. There are some new designs out as well from partners. So um, despite the fact that this is one of the few 70 series cards that is not able to outmatch the previous 80 series card, they're like the same. The 80 is sometimes better from the 3080. It does still have partner models. So the 4070 designs from board partners are mostly in line with the existing 4070 Ti options on the market with a few exceptions. We'll take a look at a couple of those here. First up, Gigabyte has a special Korea OC edition for, and we're just guessing here, the Korean market. It overall looks similar to the Gigabyte Aero 4080, but with a far more colorful aesthetic. The back of the card has a huge flow through area for the third fan as well. None of us here can read Korean, so let us know if the backplate actually says anything. We're kind of curious what the uh, Korean market gamer marketing and advertising lingo looks like. Is it the same as in the US market where they write things like game first, work second, or whatever Asus writes on their motherboards? Or is it more serious than that? Second, Asus has an updated design for its dual line, not dual GPU, even though that would be cool. That comes in either black or white for the dual cards. It's a two fan design, hence dual, that features a clear plastic part of the shroud, somewhat reminiscent of the EVGA 20 series cards that everyone initially hated and then later said they missed. The dual 4070's cooler is uh, 2.56 slots thick. Are we actually going for like two decimal places now? Is, this, is it part of the marketing? More decimal places for the slot thickness, more better. Uh, ours is 2.56, but gigabytes at 2.567 is in fact better because there's more accuracy to the amount of decimal places that they go out to and they're rounding less. Anyway, thanks for that, Asus. Thanks, Steve. But at 2.56 slots, it's not as monstrous as most other 40 series cards on the market. Notably, this card is set up with just a single PCIe 8 pin for power instead of the 12 volt high power connector seen on all higher end 40 series cards. Getting back to the size discussion, we wish board partners would scale down these cards in situations where it's not necessary. Nvidia's own FE card, for example, performed just fine thermally at a standard two slot size without even making the card taller than a PCIe bracket or using a vapor chamber. And that is concerning for the board partners because they have to figure out what to do to continue competing with their own supplier and just making the card larger so that it technically, uh, like on a pure technicality, wins in thermals, that might not be enough because a lot of people just want a normal sized video card. So it's a weird market right now and they're in a hard spot if, if they're a board partner of NVIDIA. Uh, next one, RTX Video Super Resolution comes to VLC. So RTX Video Super Resolution is breaking out of its browser prison by way of VLC integration. NVIDIA's recent feature to upscale videos playing in Chrome and Chromium-based browsers is available in a special test version of the popular VLC media player. Version 3.0.19 RTX is available for download if you want to try it out yourself. You can guess why it has RTX in it. This build is set to automatically activate RTX VSR when you have the feature enabled in the NVIDIA control panel. 
It leverages the tensor cores to do upscaling in real time, creating a clearer image on low resolution video. We tested it out and got good results using one of our own videos. And here you can see how VSR did a good job of cleaning up the GN logo. This means that anything in your local media collection can now benefit from this upscaling technique without actually converting the files to a higher resolution permanently. Bear in mind, this is a test build though, because while trying it out, we found this bug that causes the video to ignore the aspect ratio and squish when you resize the window. It's likely to be fixed before being added to the main branch though. Up next, Pharonix has a small article about a big feature coming to Intel Meteor Lake, and it's L4 cache. So many of you likely aware there are different levels of cache, for example, L1, L2, L3. Uh, there hasn't been an L4 for quite some time now. Maybe you can kind of categorize vCache in that way, but it's officially it's L3 cache. And regardless, the different levels of cache are at different, they have different speeds they operate at. Uh, they have different costs. So L1, for example, costs more to implement than say L3. And it's not just the literal cost of SRAM, it's the cost in terms of the physical area within the silicon. Where is it? What area is it taking up? And is that sort of a high value real estate? The answer if it's L1 is yes, it is very high value real estate within the silicon. Uh, but more cash typically is better, except in the X3D, you see that it's not always the case. It depends on the application. So the last time that Intel did anything with an L4 or L4 equivalent at least was the two Broadwell CPUs that had 128 megabytes of eDRAM on board. That was an L4 cache. We don't know this time whether the only integrated graphics will be able to access this new memory, the L4 that is from Meteor Lake, or if the CPU cores will also be able to leverage it. If the whole chip can hit this cache, it may be that Intel is following in AMD's successful vCache integration. Not every application will benefit from it, but in games, you'll typically see that uplift. Due to the nature of how on-processor memory works, this L4 cache is almost guaranteed to be both larger and slower than L3, yet still faster, for sure, than going out to main system memory, where you're crossing a lot more physical space and hitting something that's potentially slower. If engineering goes in Intel's favor here, it could mean a big boost to performance in certain scenarios but temper your expectations. Just because AMD's larger cache works doesn't necessarily mean that Intel's will. Next one, QuakeCon is back. On the heels of E3 being canceled, probably forever, but they aren't saying right now, Bethesda has announced it's far more enjoyable QuakeCon returning in 2023, but this time they're focusing heavily, actually almost exclusively, on bring your own PC, basically nonstop LAN party. For the past three years, QuakeCon has been digital only, but now you can return again in person to the Bring Your Own Computer LAN event. The event will be held in Grapevine, Texas from August 10 to 13th. This time there won't be an exhibit hall and there actually won't be general admission tickets either, but there will be other activities for entrance to the Bring Your Own PC area. And those other activities include tabletop gaming, vendor booths, and the finale to the annual Quake World Championships. Even though the in-person event is focused on the nonstop LAN party, QuakeCon 23 will still feature live streams from Bethesda that anyone can watch. And if any major announcements come out of those, we'll let you know. We'll be watching it remotely. And uh, this is a potential opportunity for Bethesda to make moves or announcements on a Doom follow-up. The past couple Doom entries have been very successful for the company. Uh, were generally well received and from a benchmarking standpoint have been really interesting. They've also used this as a platform of the past for large names like John Carmack to come and do technical discussions. So we'll be paying attention to it. Up next, Intel is continuing to cut a number of its non-core businesses and the next one to get the ax is its pre-built server solutions business. So this doesn't affect its server CPUs. They're still doing those. They would be very bad if they weren't. Uh, just pre-built servers. And they're selling this to design and IT solutions company MITAC, M-I-T-A-C. You tell me how to pronounce it. Serve the Home got a statement from Intel directly. So Intel said to Serve the Home, quote, in line with Intel's continued efforts to prioritize investments in its IDM 2.0 strategy, we've made the difficult decision to exit our data center solutions group. They go on to say that their partner will have the right to manufacture and sell products based on their designs and say that they're ensuring the DSG team and stakeholders are supported during the transition. And normally this type of change might be announced in an earnings call where they can kind of bury it with other good or bad news, <laughs> but to 
at least it gets company then. But in this case, Intel broke convention, announced it separately. Uh, and one of the points that sort of the home made was that Intel has historically had uh, advanced technology prior to other big names like Dell and HP Enterprise. On the recent past, Intel has also shed itself of the Optane and Network Switch units. XE Graphics and Arc Graphics seem safe for now, but you never know what might happen. It depends on how impatient the shareholders are. Up next, AMD is launching some new workstation cards with a lot of memory. So they have two models coming up specifically that are 32 gigabytes and 48 gigabytes. And these are W7800 and W7900 GPUs. So that W class is in the uh, workstation family of parts, kind of like a Quadro competitor. These have error correcting GDDR6. It's a little different. And they use the same GPU package that you find on the 7900 XTX and 7900 XT. That means that they have the same multi-chip design with a large graphics compute die flanked by smaller memory cache dies. The other specs are pretty much in line with consumer cards, aside from the total board power ratings, which are 295 watts for the W7900 and 260 watts for the W7800. Physically, both cards feature radial blower fans and power connectors on the end, which are typical of workstation cards. For display outputs, it's Oops, all display port with three standard DP 2.1 and one mini DP. Notably, the W7900 has a two and a half slot cooler and a three slot IO bracket. Normally, the workstation class doesn't go this thick for case and server compatibility reasons, as well as not blocking off PCIe slots on the board unnecessarily. But we assume AMD wanted the extra cooling and the potential to lower noise over multi card compatibility. These new cards won't be cheap. The top spec W7900 is priced at $4,000 and the W7800 at $2,500. If you want that much memory on one card and pro driver support though, you've got to pay for it. Unless you don't and you use the NVIDIA GeForce cards or the AMD Radeon cards uh, for your applications if they can run on them. Except for the GeForce one. The problem with that is technically it's against the terms and conditions for the drivers for GeForce cards to use them in data centers. You are technically not allowed to use them that way because oops, we made stuff that's too powerful and a lot of our customers realize that they don't need the really expensive ones with validated drivers because they don't do things that are that important to require the validation. It's a different topic entirely and this time BDR won't have to be the one who transcribes and writes up a report for NVIDIA executives to figure out if they should be mad at me. Congratulations, BDR. It's someone else's problem now. Looking forward to hearing from them. Uh, there's a new mod for Cyberpunk 2077. This follows the path tracing update that we did a piece on. If you want to learn about the path tracing integration in Cyberpunk, we've got a whole content piece that does image quality comparisons and does some benchmarks for you. But there's a mod that tries to improve the performance while still using the path tracing or the RT, ray tracing overdrive mode for Cyberpunk. And the mod author is Erock, who claims that these changes provide a 1.25x to a 2.0x performance increase while using RT overdrive, which is a very large range. But in either case, uh, that's a lot more performance. In simplest terms, RT overdrive allows for all of the light sources in the game to cast shadows and to bounce off of all surfaces. Also, it gets rid of errors brought on by traditional methods, like light bleeding through a wall where it shouldn't be. But back to the mod. This first iteration is pretty simple, and it aims to do two things under the hood. First, reduce the number of ray bounces from two to one. That's going to somewhat limit the realism and the complexity of the lighting, but it still provides effects like the light bouncing off of a colored surface and picking up the color of said surface, also known as global illumination. The second thing that the mod is supposed to do is reduce the far range of the rays which should cull the rays from particularly distant light sources. Based on comments, however, it seems like this part isn't functioning correctly. Despite the changes, the resulting image still looks good and you get to keep the overall benefits that come from ray tracing all of the lights. For example, in these user uploaded images comparing Psycho RT to modded path tracing, we can point out a few important details. With the mod, the blue neon 24 sign in the left of the image properly casts blue light onto the surface behind it. Blue light also bounces off of the stall in front of it, which you don't see in Psycho RT mode. Another benefit of this approach is that it's still using the full RT suite for things like global illumination, which makes natural looking shadows appear everywhere in the scene. The top of the metal shelter in the right of the image and the fire escape support to the right of the beep sign 
are both easy examples of this benefit. Now you are cutting out a large part of what makes RT overdrive interesting here, but that large part is what makes it difficult to run on a lot of hardware. So it's cool to see the community stepping up and changing the game how they want like this. Uh, potentially CDPR could add in some of its own toggles and sliders to help as well if they cared to, but then that wouldn't sell RTX 4090s. Just figure, throw one more over the fence as BDR is on his way out the door. Uh, we're, just, we're just making all kinds of problems for NVIDIA this week. There's no one there. It's like, it's like the mods are asleep meme, except it's real life. It's not Reddit. Uh, okay, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching, as always. Uh, the mods at NVIDIA are asleep. Go to store.gamersnexus.net or patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out directly, and we'll see you all next time.